Um, I'm a graduate from King's College London with a master's degree in sustainable cities. Um, earlier in 2020, I started to seek a career change from my previous role as head of content in a health startup in London. As a tropical girl at heart, I ventured into Costa Rica to learn a little bit more about nature conservation. Um, and my time in the Central American rainforest reminded me of the need to conserve our Malaysian rainforests. So then I returned home just pre, um, well, mid pandemic, well, early pandemic, and joined TRCRC as the project manager for Elmina Rainforest Knowledge Center. With this role, I hope to address the growing disconnect to our natural world by encouraging connections between humans and nature. So now I'm going to introduce you to the Elmina team. Um, so they're co-hosts to this event today. Um, there's Iklas and Tashwini, both are researchers at Elmina Rainforest Knowledge Center. So I'll let them introduce themselves. Um, Tash, you can start. Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Tashwini. I'm a researcher at TRCRC based in Elmina. I have a background in forestry and plant biology. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Iklas. Uh, I'm also a researcher at TRCRC, uh, working at the Elmina Rainforest Knowledge Center. So um, some of our, what we're doing there includes uh, the maintenance of our nursery in ERKC and also a biodiversity assessment of the Bukit Traka Forest Reserve. Uh, all right. Basically, if you guys have any questions, um, as in my presentation, as we get, go along, Tashwini and HS um, will try to answer as many questions as possible um, in the message box, in the chat box. Um, there will also be a Q&A session at the end of my presentation. So if you had any further questions that they can't answer, I'll try and answer them um, during the Q&A, okay? Um, so I'd like to start with um, an exercise um, that's gonna be kind of interactive. Um, basically, when I say the word conservation, what is the first word that comes to mind? Iklas will share a link um, where you can share um, the first word that comes to mind and they'll pop up on our screen here. Um, please click the link, um, pollev.com forward slash Abza Aziz 531. Nice. Coexistence, I like that one. So a common word that's come up is resources and forests, sustainability. Nice. Okay, so this is um, so this exercise. I just wanted to kind of get an idea of what you guys um, are thinking um, when I say the word conservation before I explain what it means to us. Cool. So for, how does conservation fit into the bigger picture of protecting of our environment? So for me, I like to think of it as a spectrum. So on the one side, you have um, preservation 
And on the other side, you have exploitation. And somewhere in the middle, we have conservation. So preservation is the idea where you want to keep nature completely as is. So you restrict all human and vehicles from entering. So it's left completely untouched. Exploitation, on the other hand, would be when you take and take and take from nature without thinking about what will happen when it's gone. Conservation is somewhere in the middle where you realize that nature and humans can coexist. So like the words that were coming up in the poll earlier and that we need each other and we cannot just take and take and leave nothing for our future generations. So we have to, if we were to take from nature because it is, provides our resource as mentioned earlier um, is that we take responsibly. So examples of preservation are things like nature reserves um, where no one is allowed in um, and that allows it to be kept as pristine as possible. Um, conservation is where you have things like community forests, um, where a limited number of people are allowed in to enjoy the beauty of it, but we still keep it as nice as possible by planting more trees, um, by carrying out forest restoration or enrichment planting so that future generations get to enjoy it as well. And then on the other hand, there's exploitation, which, you know, an example where we see this in Malaysia is, you know, a lot of like logging when logging companies cut down entire forests um, with no plans to replenish it um, whatsoever. Um, both, so conservation and preservation is quite similar, but conservation seeks the sustainable use of nature by humans because we also still need it to survive, but we take only what we need and we don't push beyond our planetary boundaries. Um, so the key concept is to live in coexistence with nature, um, which allows nature to do its work, um, such as regulating water and cleaning the air. So the reason why I've explained these concepts is because at TRCRC, we believe in a practical approach um, by combining both conservation and preservation, because humans still need it to survive by using resources from the environment, but we need to use these resources responsibly. And while we do that, we want to make sure that the untouched parts of nature are still able to stay that way. So because both humans and the planet cannot survive if we just take and never give back. And I know that's a lot of the reason why a lot of you here today, um, because you feel like you need to pay it forward to nature. Um, so I, I, I understand that a lot of you share the same sentiments. So what we do at TRCRC is to do both conservation and preservation um, to maintain our forests. Um, we aim to spread awareness, like how I'm talking to you today. And we look to find solutions to our problems to sustainable development. So a brief kind of like explanation about Malaysia's rainforest. I'm not going to delve into detail and I'm sure a lot of you may already know. Um, so Malaysia's rainforest um, characteristic vegetation is the dense evergreen rainforests. Um, rainforests are generally composed of tall broadleaf trees and usually are found in wet tropical uplands and lowlands in the, around the equator. So Malaysia's legislations that, the main legislations that cover our Malaysia's rainforests is the National Forestry Act 1984, amended in 1993, the National Forest Policy 1977, updated 1992, and the National Policy of Biological Diversity 1998. Um, if you would like any further reading about um, the legislations, um, please contact me and I can share some resources. Um, the permanent forest reserves are, there are, more, there are many more classifications, but the four main functions that are classified under the act would be one, protection forest, which is to ensure the stability of the country's climatic and physical conditions, the control of water resources, soil fertility, environmental quality, biodiversity conservation, flood uh, mitigation, and erosion to rivers and agricultural land. So it's protection forest one. Two, work forest, for the continued supply of forest products at reasonable rates in the economy of the country to the needs of agriculture, domestic, industrial, and export. So that's work forests. Um, C is amenity forests, uh, which is explained as um, to maintain a sufficient area um, as a recreation. Um, your screen is not sharing the slides. You're still on the poll slides. Oh, what? yeah. Sorry for the tech error. Is it, um, has it changed slides? Yes, yes, it has. Sorry, thank you for that. Um, okay, so as I was saying, sorry. Uh, so protection forests, work forests, um, amenity forests, 
and um, research and education forests. So these are the main classifications and obviously there are more. Um, so the website that I tend to go to to look at this is www.mybis.gov.my, which is mybis spelled as M-Y-B-I-S.gov.my. And that gives you um, the listings of the different forest reserves in all the states in Malaysia. And it'll give you the classification as per your search. Okay, so now I'm going to go into dipterocarps because obviously this whole um, workshop is about a voluntary dipterocarp seed project. So why am I focused on this particular species um, is because they are a keystone of the native forests in our region. And it's Afzal, uh, again, your slides, you are two slides behind. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes. Okay, so, the, so it makes up 80% of Malaysia's forest canopy. It gives structure to the rainforest ecosystem and it's very important for the habitat, flora and fauna. So they are a keystone species um, of the native forests of this region. So that's why we're focused on the dipterocarp species. So the Dipterocarpaceae are a family of 16 genera and about 695 known species of mainly tropical lowland uh, rainforest trees. So the family name um, from the type, the genus Dipterocarpus, is derived from Greek. So the Latin name translates as D2, Teron winged, Carpus fruit. So this refers to the two winged- Oksa, sorry, can you move to the next slide? The slide is not changing. I have moved to the next slide. Um, pro probably like reshare um, the screen again. Okay, let me. Sorry, bear with me one moment. I'm sorry for the technical glitch. Are you able to see that? Yep, it looks good now.
And when I change it, does it change? It does. Yes, it's changing. Okay, I'm so sorry about that, guys. Okay, um, I'm just going to resume from here, okay? Okay, so um, as I was saying, the family name um, is derived from the Latin name Deterocarpus. So D2, Teron wing and carpus fruit. And this refers to the two wing seed. While the name suggests that it's two wings, the wings may vary between zero to five wings depending on the species. Um, the largest genera are Shoria, um, um, which is about 196 different species. Um, Hopia, which is about 104 different species. Dipterocarpus, about 70 species. And Vatica, about 65 species. Uh, many of these are large forest emergent species, typically reaching the heights of 40 to 70 meters, and some even over 80 meters. Um, the tallest known living specimen um, is about 93 meters tall. So what else is special about these trees beside the fact that they make up the major forest type? Um, so the reason why we focus on these particular species, um, there's plenty of reasons why our primary focus is to regenerate this species. Um, number one, the trees that belong in this family have been heavily logged in the past um, because the trees mostly belong in the heavy wood category, um, which is usually then desi desirable to be used in construction and in making furniture. Therefore, it greatly depletes their number in the wild. Two, the flowers, uh, the trees do not flower every year. So it has quite a long cycle of reproduction. Um, and it's usually the intervals are between five to seven years, um, which then slows down their ability to regenerate. And obviously a caveat here with um, climate change is that it's becoming much more difficult to predict um, when these flowering seasons may occur. Um, number three, the fruits are relatively woody, which limits the distance of seed dispersal from the mother trees. So while, despite the fact that they have wings, they're, not, they're biologically not made to fly very far. Um, so this poor seed dispersal makes the recovery of our climax rainforest difficult, um, unless we obviously have human intervention to plant, to plant such species. If there are no dipterocarps in the forest, then there's no succession of a secondary forest to a primary and climax forest. So um, they're also relatively high in oil content. So when they do fall to the forest floor, they usually tend to be heavily predated by ants and other insects. And of course, the trees are in this family are our pride. Um, it's one of the tallest tropical trees in the world and one of the oldest trees um, in Malaysia belong to the Dipterocarpaceae family. Um, some of you may already be familiar with this. This is the IUCN red list. Um, what this is, is an inventory of global conservation status of biological species. Um, it uses a certain set of criteria to evaluate the risk of extinction of a thousand of thousands and thousands of species and subspecies. Um, the diptera carps that we focus on tend to fall within the category of vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered. So I'm going to show you a video. Um, a short video of how the TRCRC team, um, what, the, what we do to help conserve these um, important tree species.
Yeah, so now that you've seen um, the basic of what we do, um, I'd like to share with you the Tropical Rainforest Living Collections. So in order to safeguard the tropical rainforest plant species and ensure a stable ecosystem, TRCRC have established conservation sites um, known as Tropical Rainforest Living Collections to safeguard um, our threatened species. So what we do in our, in our conservation sites um, is the seeds from the threatened plants are collected germinated and then planted in our established sites to produce seeds and planting material for restoration projects. So um, the two main um, uh, conservation sites that we were working on since 2012 are in Para and Sabah. So in Para, we are looking after 500 hectares of the Amanjaya Forest Reserve. Um, so we work together with the Para Forestry Department and we have this for 30 plus 30 years, so 60 years total, um, to look after this um, little portion of the Amanjaya Forest Reserve. Um, in Mersuli Sabah, we also work with the Sabah Forestry Department, um, where we have been looking after 224 hectares of um, the portion there. And this has been, um, and in agreement to look after this place for about 99 years. And then our third living collection, which is our latest one, is I guess in a way our flag, flagship headquarters, um, is in Elmina in Slangor. It's a lot smaller, so it's just one, uh, it just covers about 1.09 acres. Um, and that's just a small little nursery site um, as like our urban location center um, to learn more about what we do. So just a little bit more about the Elmina Rainforest Knowledge Center. So we partnered with Sam Darby Properties, which was originally an agricultural business. Um, and basically they have, as part of their sustainability initiative, um, started engaging with TRCRC on building the ERKC to help conserve the endangered rare and threatened species um, in Malaysia and to preserve the existing biodiversity that's in the area. Um, ERKC will serve as an environmental education center for the public to visit, um, to learn more about conservation and to get some hands-on experience of germinating seeds and planting trees. Um, so we also plan to do some cap capacity building efforts to provide local employment to the community and also to be a research uh, center for research and development. Our current um, researchers are doing a biodiversity study there that's both Tash and Iklas. And through our bank of seedlings that we produce in our nursery, um, we'll likely get to supply Sam Darby's neighborhoods with native trees. So this is the first species that we've managed to germinate um, in Elmina. So this is known as the Linta Bukit or Hopia helferi. Um, it's listed as critically endangered in 1998 by the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. Um, it's about a medium-sized tree which can grow up to 20 to 37 meters tall. Um, its wood is used for light and heavy construction, including uh, handicrafts. And as you can see from the images, um, the seeds are really, really tiny. They're about six to eight meters diameter and six to 11 uh, millimeters, sorry, in length. So it's really, really small. Um, and what you see um, on the image on the right is what they look like about after, um, let's say about three months, um, in the germination beds and it's grown about that tall but once in like 30 years it'll be huge and you probably wouldn't be able to wrap your your arms around it so over here um, we have also germinated um, malaysia's national tree which is the pokok merbau um, otherwise known as insia palambanica this uh, the latin name this is what they look like after germination about six weeks um, and this is what they look like about, about 10 weeks in. So this is um, what our germination lo beds look like in Elmina. Um, so now I'm just gonna share with you the steps to forest restoration. So at TRCRC, our core conservation goal is to lead landscape-wide protection and reforestation projects throughout the country. So this is how our step-by-step -step to how we achieve our goals. Um, it always starts with seed collections and seed surveys because without seeds and saplings, restoration cannot happen. Um, so this is the reason why we um, thought of doing the voluntary diptera carb seed project, um, just to teach you guys about the first stage and get you guys involved in the first step of this process. Um, so I'm just gonna share some frequently asked questions because after I shared information about this project, um, I received a couple of emails asking questions about um, the seed collections. Um, and one of the common questions that I was asked is what is the natural way for this tree to seed and grow? 
Um, so as previously mentioned in my previous slide, um, they mostly flower once every five to seven years. And as I said, it can sometimes be unpredictable um, because of climate change. Um, this is an event popularly known as mass flowering, and this tends to happen between the months of June, uh, sorry, months of March, um, all the way through to July. Uh, again, this is very dependent on the wet weather condition. So the flowering period also varies, which lasts between a few weeks to a few months. Um, and then usually after being pollinated by um, insects, the fruits mature and drop to the forest floor in a huge number. So the seeds are recalcitrant, meaning that they will germinate immediately um, because they cannot afford to lose much of the seed moisture level. Many will start to germinate as the, they will require a shaded environment to germinate unless they get eaten by insects, then they'll no longer viable seeds. Um, then if the microclimate permits, the seedlings will then grow into big and beautiful trees. But of course, out of the thousand of seeds that fall from the, um, from the parent tree through natural means, it's maybe only a handful of that will survive. Whereas with human intervention, we, we, you know, our germination success rate um, will be a lot higher. So that leads to the next question that I'm often asked is what is the impact of human efforts if we were involved in this process versus through natural means? So when we intervene and start germinating the seeds, um, we can help to restore our rainforests a lot quicker because as I mentioned, the survival rate on by natural means is a lot lower. Um, so, uh, so yeah, and as I said, it can take years for the climax forest to form. So that's why human intervention is needed. Um, the Ditterra carpaceae seeds cannot form a seed bank. Um, they're predated by insects. They can't lose moisture level and their reproduction period is, is very long and their, their regeneration period is even longer. So with the various limitations that these seed have and due to many habitat destructions that are threatening the presence of this tree species, um, we need to start taking action now through assisted regeneration. So the whole point of this exercise, of course, is to have large scale restoration projects. And some of the ones that TRCRC are involved in, um, which you may have already heard of, is number one is um, Nestle's project relief. They've made it, Nestle has made a pledge to plant 3 million trees over three years. Um, this is following their successful project relief um, in Sabah, Kinabatangan. Um, and we are one of their official partners to help them fulfill this goal. Um, the second one is we are funded by Yayasan Saim Darby, and they have a huge restoration project to restore 100 hectares of the Amanjaya Forest Reserve as well. So this will um, basically facilitate not only uh, the regenerating of forests, but also it's focused on a wildlife corridor that connects the Belum and Temungo Forest Reserve. Um, our executive director, Dr. Zaiman, is also a consultant on the federal government's plan to plant 100 million trees by 2025. Um, obviously, this is a very ambitious goal, and um, we, we hope to be able to assist them um, beyond the consulting means. And other restoration projects that are maybe on a smaller scale, not to the large hundreds of hectares, are with corporate sponsors, let's say, to plant an X number of trees in various different locations across the country. So to go a little bit more specific into our project protocols. So you've seen the whole process in our video, um, but this is a little bit more specific on how we carry this out. So first, what we do is we locate and identify and mark the mother trees. We access when it's ready for collection. If needed, we use a big slingshot um, to get the seeds to fall to the ground. And then we collect it from the forest floor. These seeds are then brought to our nursery where we process them for germination and transplant. Um, after that stage, they stay in the poly bag for about one, uh, one and a half to two years as they grow. So as you can see in the Hopia, like after three months, they're only about this big. So they do require some time to mature, um, to reach a certain height um, to, uh, when they are saplings. And then they'll go through a stage of hardening before they get planted into the wild. And this also can vary between one to three months. So now I'm going to show you a video of the Sabah team carrying out seed collections. We're now at the highest point of Mursuli. Um, Mursuli is about 202 hectares in size, composing of degraded forests. Um, it's classified as a class four virgin forest reserve, but uh, in recent times it was encroached by illegal palm oil owners. 
Um, at the moment, it's pretty much on a secondary phase of regeneration, and we are pretty much in the sense in the second year on the mark on the restoration of this site. At the moment, we're in the Ulu Sagama region looking for rare endangered trees. Uh, we're, we're on the third stage of our, our seed collection process, and we have currently just found a, a tarp, a wild strain of tarp at the back. We are basically searching for rare endangered trees that uh, can basically be supplementing our living collection. <laughs> In the living collection, we are collecting rare endangered trees based on the IUCN status. When we come across these species in the forest, we basically tag them, mark the parent tree, and take all kinds of information such as the GPS location or, and the height of the tree. So when we go back into a nursery, we have all the records of what we just recently collected. So we just found a pear shorter melanonan, which is a critically endangered tiptoe cup uh, species. Under the IUCN, it's uh, red listed. At the moment, the tree is ready for collection and the fruits are ripe. Uh, but what we have to do is we have to basically shake the tree to make sure we can collect fresh seeds so that the pigs and, and whatnot animals that are competing with us do not get them first. Yeah, so now that you've seen um, the video, I hope the video you watch just provides an understanding of how the seed collections are carried out. Um, if I were to break this down a little bit more simply, it's done in three steps. So the first step that we use is um, we use aerial recce with, a, with drone technology. 
Um, this allows us to understand the timing and schedule of mass fruiting and to collect the GPS co coordinates of the flowering trees. When we have those coordinates of, of the aerial view, we then carry out ground recce where we can locate, mark, and identify the mother trees. And then the third stage, um, very simply, is to access the mother trees when they're ready for collection. Um, and we'll organize the seed collection expeditions that will be led either by TRCRC or one of you. So to go into a little bit of detail of what masting means. So mass seeding, which is also called masting, um, refers to the synchronous production of large number of seed of fruits by a population of plants. So in the image that you see here, um, this is an image taken by a photographer with the Instagram handle at heartpatrick. So this is the Rawang bypass, and this is what a mass fruiting event looks like. Um, this is the species Hop Hopia subalata, which is endemic to the Kanching Forest Reserve where the Rawang bypass cuts across. And this is generally what it looks like when the trees are flowering. Mass seeding predominantly um, occurs in wind-pollinated wind tree species and observed in dipterocarp species. So the idea of how to identify masting is, you know, the typical forest canopy um, is usually just green. So when we spot um, odd colors where, you know, whether it's white or yellow or whatever, you'll be able to identify maybe these are going to be where the flowering trees are. So what we do is we, um, just to show you how, how that works for the drone, drone technology, this is how. Uh, you want to take a picture from the top, then you get a GPS location of the tree. Yeah, so we use a drone to fly uh, over. You want to take a picture from the top. And then next, when we have the coordinates, we carry out the ground recce to identify the species and monitor the mother tree. Um, it is very difficult to identify the species um, via the aerial photo. Um, so what we tend to do is we go down to the ground, we collect leaf samples, we collect other samples like the bark, um, et cetera. And that's how we're able to identify exactly which species it is. And then we basically monitor the ones that we would like to collect that are critically endangered or endangered. Um, when the seeds are ready for collection, we'll then organize for seed collection expeditions, either led by, well, likely to be led by TRCRC, or perhaps one of you um, who's interested in carrying this out. And of course, TRCRC will provide the technical support for this. So I've outlined some potential locations in Selangor as seen on this map. Um, the current stage where we're at is we're at the stage of doing aerial recce to survey the locations of flowering trees. Um, so far, as, as what we've shown is we've noticed that there are flowering trees on the Rawang Bypass. Uh, we also know that there are flowering trees in the Slango State Park because we've done aerial recce there. Um, many of these locations, um, we still have yet to do the recce, um, but we still have time, obviously, because if the trees only start flowering um, around this period, um, seed collections won't happen until somewhere about August, September, October time. Um, there will be more potential locations um, available in Pahang, for example. So one of our project partners is um, Seeds Malaysia. Um, I believe Raza is on this call. Hi, Raza. <laughs> um, he'll be looking out for locations in Pahang and he'll basically help out um, to scout the locations there. So after all of these seed collections are being collected, um, then it comes to seed processing. So this is what it looks like when we do seed processing in the Elmina nursery. This is the team processing over a, a thousand seed, a seeds of the Hopia halferi. So it's, it's quite a fun event. You know, we all get together, we sit around a table or, you know, obviously if there's more of us, we'd have to sit uh, in the hall. Um, and we process the seedlings by the seeds by taking off the wings and then we then move it onto the germination beds. So here is what we do when we're processing in the germination beds is that the germination beds are basically just sand. Um, and then we put the seeds in the germination beds. Um, we also have automated sip sprinklers um, for here. And then um, we just basically water daily and we watch the seeds germinate and grow. Um, another way is also we have a lot of help from our volunteers. So here's some images of um, our volunteers from the Slango youth community um, where they help with seedling care, which includes transplanting seedlings, weeding, watering, mixing soil, and also with pest control. So this is just them 
transplanting the Hopia Helferi. So this Hopia Helferi is ready for transplant because the cortilisins have already fallen off. So at this stage that they can then start growing into our polybags and they'll be there for about um, between one and a half to two years. So here are four ways that you can get involved, which is the whole point of this workshop, um, is number one, uh, you can lead a seed collection group. Um, this will be ideal for someone who's very confident with um, working in the forest, um, has the capacity to organize the seed collection expeditions. Of course, TRCRC will provide support, but this will primarily be self-organized. For example, someone like Raza from Seed Malaysia already works in this field and has boots on the ground um, that is able to help with the seed collection group. Um, and then obviously we will provide support for the seed collection protocols and maybe one of our members of TRCRC will follow um, when the expedition is being carried out. A second way is to join in on a seed collection expedition that will be already organized. Um, this will be ideal for the individual who just wants to come along and help out as an extra pair of hands to help to collect seeds, um, is keen to hike um, and not afraid to go into the deep jungle. A third way would be to assist with seed processing. Um, this will be ideal for an individual who would like to get up close and familiar with each species and seeds. Um, we'll also be collecting samples, uh, leaf samples and trees, uh, basically sample of the trees. Um, so we're able to do a workshop on tree identification basics. Of course, this will be open to um, not, not just for the people who assist in seed processing, but of course with um, limitations due to the um, pandemic will have to limit the number, but this will be open to the members who are joining today. Um, the fourth way is to volunteer at the Elmina nursery. So we always need extra set of hands at our nursery, and this is open at any time um, for people to come by who are interested to learn more about the work that we do and would like to gain some hands-on experience in our nursery. So ICLAS will now share a link to a Google form um, where you can um, fill in your areas of interest and locations of interest. So when we organize and start organizing these expedition, I'll know who to reach out to, um, to help out. Um, so I'm not sure yet, yeah. has each sent the forum? Yeah, okay. So yeah, so please um, fill out that form. I'll also send it out again um, in case you guys haven't filled it out yet. Um, there also be some upcoming workshops. Um, so the upcoming workshops is number one is this app called Seed It. So Zaiman is one of the consultants for this app. It's in its beta stage, um, but it'll be quite useful to, um, to teach you guys how to use it um, because it's how it's an easy way to start monitoring the flowering trees. Um, the second one that we'll do a little bit closer to the date of seed collections is a bit more detailed about the seed collection protocols, um, which will be hosted by our project manager of the living collection in Mersuli Sabah, Benny. Um, he's very experienced in this field. Of course, he's been carrying out seed collections since I think 2016. So he'll definitely be able to uh, go through in a lot more detail the seed collection protocols. Um, the third will be a diptera carp tree identification workshop. This will be a um, very basic workshop to help you identify the different genera of diptera carp species um, alongside with seed processing. This will be hosted by um, Tashwini at Elmina. And then the fourth will be a nursery management workshop. This will be alongside seed processing or as and when volunteers are interested to come by and help out at the nursery. So I'm now gonna open the floor to Q&A um, and just gonna read through the chat. Um, so Chloe, is the Kota Damansara community forest included in this round? Um, I have not reached out to, to KDCF yet, but yes, they're definitely on our list um, of locations to look at. Um, Izaidi from Diri Bumi Typing. I have a group of volunteers in Para and capable to organize seed collections with a local expert. How can I help? Um, so for this, if you are interested in becoming one of the seed collection organizers, um, please reach out to me um, and I'll basically help you with the protocols and um, the organization of um, each of these expeditions.
Will TRCRC help to arrange clearance letters if we need to collect during MCO? Yes. So TRCRC will provide support in um, both getting letters to travel um, if we are still in, in an MCO. Um, we're also going to uh, make sure that if we do enter forest reserves that require permits, that we get those permits as well. Hence why um, I'm doing this um, you know, a few months before we the seed collections are due, um, obviously because we would like to be on the legal side of everything. Um, I'll, how do we get notified of the upcoming workshop? So um, your, I have your registration um, details from this form. Um, and so I will be sending out an email um, for the workshops that are coming up. From Zulfika, I noticed some of the seeds you moved into poly bags fast, but some you let it grow into planter beds without poly bags. What happens to the saplings in the planter beds without poly bags? Will they go straight into the field or into poly bags? So Zulfika, what you saw just now was the difference between a Hopia Helfera and a Merbao. So Hopia is a lot slower growing. So the Merbao after um, eight weeks, it already, it, it's already like 30 centimeters tall. So at that stage, um, it still will be transplanted into poly bags first, because as I mentioned for the protocols, it requires to grow um, to a certain height for at least a year or two. And then it also needs to go through a hardening phase um, before it gets planted into the wild. Um, the reason being is this is the best way to ensure their survival into the wild. Um, the Hopia, as you saw, is it's, it's a lot slower growing. Um, so that's why the duration varies between one year or two years. It really depends on the species. Of course, if we're working with species that are very, very slow growing, like the Belian tree only grows like one centimeter a year, for example. Um, so that will take a lot longer in the poly bags before they can be um, out in the wild. So can I just add in a little? So basically, um, the uh, seedlings in which the cotyledons are still attached, we can keep them in the germination bed. So because they are dependent on the nutrients from the cotyledons. But once the cotyledons have fallen off, then uh, we transplant it as soon as possible into polybags because they'll need nutrients from the, from the soil. Thank you, Iklas. Um, would there be any tree ID during seed collection activities? Yes, absolutely. So um, we have to ID the species first um, before we do seed collections. Um, and of course, if people are coming with us for the seed collection expedition, um, we will show leaf samples to explain how these trees have been ID'd in the process. Um, it's likely that every single seed collection expedition will be, there will be a local expert um, going with you. Um, we don't recommend that people who have zero experience whatsoever and no knowledge um, of the trees at all to go by themselves because one, this may be dangerous and two, um, we would like to collect species that um, are in the, you know, either endangered or in the dipterocarp family. So seed collection ID um, will definitely be happening. Um, Chloe, do you involve Orang Asli in your conservation efforts in Peninsula Malaysia? Yes, absolutely. So one of the projects, the flagship projects that we do um, with the Habitat Foundation in Perak is we involve the Orang Asli community from the Jahai tribe. So uh, we've done two programs with them. The first pilot program was a seed buyback program. So of course the Orang Asli, the Jahai tribe, um, they, they sustain themselves from the land. So they are very familiar with where the trees are. So what we do is we, uh, we buy back seeds from them. Let's say we tell them that these seeds are flowering or they already know and then we buy back per kilo of seeds and the price varies depending on the species. And then we realize uh, one of the way that we can help capacity build and allow them for more like vertical integration is to teach them how to germinate these seeds themselves. So then they can earn more money if they sell saplings as opposed to seeds alone. Um, so last year in July, um, I went over to the Balom rainforest where they live and um, we taught them how to build their own nurseries. Um, so it's a mini nursery establishment in their village themselves. So it's easy access for them um, and they can germinate themselves. Um, and we've just received an update from them in February this year. And they've managed to, um, they've managed to germinate over, 
I think it was over like 2000 saplings. So it's really, really promising. Um, so we absolutely involve Orang Asli in our conservation efforts. Um, we also involve, well, the main thing that we do with Orang Asli is mainly for seed sourcing, um, not just in Perak, but also with the communities in Selangu and in Pahang. So for the Nestle program with uh, Project Relief, um, a lot of these projects are very focused on community. Um, so we've engaged with Orang Asli's in Selangor as well as in Pahang too, um, besides the ones that we work with in Para. Um, Kai Xianli, how do I sign up for the workshop? I'm in Penang, not Selangor. Um, so unfortunately, this really depends on our travel restrictions. Um, if um, if we are unable to do inter-district uh, district travel between um, states, then unfortunately it might be quite difficult to join the Selangor expeditions. Um, but if we do have expeditions um, beyond that's closer to Penang, we will let you know. Uh, Thomas, who can assist to guide us to collect and replant these trees? So that will be TRCRC. We will provide support for you um, to uh, collect and replant the trees, um, either from ourselves or um, it'll be organized by our partners, like either Razak from Seeds Malaysia or any other partners that we may have. Um, May, how soon must the seeds be germinated since it's recalcitrant as mentioned? So there's a very short window period. So once we do seed collections, it has to be germinated within a span of like one to two weeks like that. So this, uh, if the seed processing will require more hands than seed collections, because let's say we collect from five mother trees um, that will be 5,000 seeds that needs to be processed within a short period of time. Um, any contact in Sarawak we can learn on this topic? Um, unfortunately, no, not in Sarawak. Um, as far as I'm, as far as I know, I can I can get in contact with maybe our network. Um, Dr. Zaiman just recently did a webinar with the Sarawak Forestry Department, um, and maybe we can get you in contact with someone from there. May, what's the difference in percentage for natural germination versus human intervention? Um, I don't have the exact percentage, but if it's natural germination, let's say out of the thousand seedlings that fall to the ground, maybe a handful, a few will survive to become big trees. Human intervention, if we get a thousand seeds from one parent tree, um, usually the success rate is like 90% germinates, um, which is about 900 um, seedlings that will grow into saplings um, that will then be replanted. The mortality rate, of course, when it then is replanted is like, let's say 10 to 20% may die, uh, depending on, on the sensitivity of the area or the species or, you know, whether we deploy the right strategy at the right time to replant. So for example, we shouldn't be replanting when it's a super, super dry season because the, the, the roots of these um, saplings will be in shock and they won't survive. So the best time to plant is usually um, during the monsoon. How do I sign up for the Kota Damans area if it's not in the form? Chloe, please contact me um, uh, on my email and I will set up um, something that's just for the KDCF community. Um, but first of all, I do have to recce the area to see if there are flowering trees there first. Ricky, can we share the link to the form to others not attending this presentation? Yes, of course you can. Um, I will. This presentation is also recorded, so I will share a recording of this um, to everyone here and also the ones that couldn't attend. Um, and I, I will also include the link there. But if you would like to share that too, then please, by all means, go ahead. Um, Jessica, would you recommend people to germinate seeds and care for saplings on their own homes before getting TRCRC to help transport, uh, transport it for planting? Um, yeah, Jessica, if you are interested to germinate seeds in your own home, that's of course fine. But, you know, people don't tend to have the space to germinate 30,000 seedlings like we do in our nursery. So if you are interested to germinate, let's say, um, the capacity that you can or you want to, then of course you can. Um, but of course, it, it's nice to utilize the space in our nursery. Carolyn, how long do you maintain and monitor trees once planted, e.g. the Nestle project? Um, so this depends on the budget. So if we have budget to maintain it for like, let's say a, a yearly annual check, we will. So of course for us, our main um, priority is to ensure that the trees that are planted um, survive. So it's not simply just a one-off exercise where we go we plant it once and then we never see it again. No, what we do is we do try to maintain that 
um, in our locations um, on an annual basis. Or if, if their budget allows, we can do it a little bit more frequently. Faisal, any partners from Trungano? No, we don't have any partners in Trungano as of yet. So far, it's only Slango, Pera, and Pahang, and Sabah. Oh, Thomas, sorry to hear about your unexpired seeds. Maybe another Masting one-on-one -on -one workshop to address these questions. Um, yes, of course, please provide any feedback um, to my email if you have any feedback from me, if you'd like to see a different type of workshop um, coming up, um, if you have any suggestions for different workshops or any topics you'd like us to cover, um, please, um, by all means, send me an email. I'm just going to type in my email here because I know that I've referred you guys to me. So please email me here. Um, Tashwini, Tyson has a question for you. How long the recalcitrant period for the seed cell culture? Would you be able to answer, Tash? Yeah, I did answer in the chat box. Oh. So recalcitrant seeds, they cannot lose more than 30% of moisture content. So storing them for a few days to two weeks max should be ideal. Okay, so I'm just gonna give you maybe two more minutes to ask any other further questions you may have, um, and then we can close the session. Um, so Sharifa from Johor, is there any letter for me to cross state? Um, so this will depend on the regulations of the MCO. If obviously in August, by August, things change, then we can look into that. Do you allow volunteers to get involved with the Orang Asli initiative? Um, well, for now, we're, we're, we're not, you know, we're not actively with them every day anymore because now we've, we've helped them build the nursery. So we only contact them as and when. Um, but if you are interested to do a little bit more work with the Orang Asli initiative, please contact me. Um, and I can get you in touch with the right members of the team um, that can get you involved with some of the work we do with Orang Asli. Um, partners in Johor. Um, so we don't have um, a specific partner in Johor. What we're doing is we're carrying out restoration work in Johor. So partnering with, um, with Nestle, so Nestle, the 3 million trees is for to be planted in Peninsula Malaysia in various different locations in the state. And of course, what they're doing is they're trying to restore either riparian zones, like the buffer zones between river and forest. Um, so we've identified um, specific locations with um, ex-palm oil people um, who need restoration on their land. Um, that's how we've identified these zones to plant um, but there's no official partner in Joho, so to speak. Okay. Well, if that's it for questions, um, if you do have any further questions, um, please feel free to write me an email. Um, if you guys have any feedback for me um, for this presentation, and if there's any particular workshops that you would like um, to see us host, um, of course, please 
um, send me an email for that too. Um, in the meantime, what I'll do is um, I'll monitor the registration list. Um, following this uh, workshop, um, I'll share um, the recording for you guys to either watch this later again or share it with the people who you think may be interested. And I'll also share the form. And then closer to the date where we can carry out these seed collection expeditions, I'll then contact you again and you'll find an email from me. So look out for your inbox. Um, any permission required when collecting seeds in for reserve forests? So yes, there is permission required. So permits are required to collect seeds in reserve forests. Not only permits to enter, but to take anything out of the forest, the permits are required for that too. So TRCRC will be handling that. Um, so when closer to the date, when we organize the seed collection expeditions, um, we will be in contact with you to get the necessary details um, to get the necessary permits for that. Um, how about initial tree ID and monitoring activities? Yeah, so for that we'll do, as I mentioned in the call, we'll do um, drone um, uh, technology first. And um, Sabina, if you would like to help with that so you can learn more on that, you know, of course, feel free to contact me and we can do it together. Jessica, how early would volunteers who can only work at nurseries be contacted? Um, well, as soon as this full lockdown is over, then volunteers are welcome to come to our nursery whenever. We always need an extra set of hands. Um, uh, I, I will when the form when the form comes back to me and I can see your area of interest is for the nursery volunteer, I'll reach out to you because it'll be that's pretty straightforward. Whenever you would like to organize a time to come to the nursery to help out we can get that arranged. Of course, when um, restrictions permit us to do that. Observe, might I chip in? So um, this is a general uh, statement on how to proceed if you've seen any trees that are seeding in your area or if you enter the forest and you notice that trees are seeding or flowering. So um, instead, because uh, if it's a forest reserve, you obviously are not supposed to actually enter the forest reserve without a permit or collect the seeds. So what you can do, however, is just uh, mark the location on your, on, the, on your map. So basically just drop a pin on your Google Maps and send it to us. Yeah. And what we will do is we will organize it. We will apply for the permits, uh, include you in the permit too. And then we will, be, we will be conducting the identification because obviously it's difficult to ID what species it is. We'll be conducting the identification and then the seed collection at a, a later date. So what we, what we uh, suggest is if you observe any trees that are flowering, let us know in advance because between the flowering and the seeding uh, seasons, maybe one to two months. So by that time, we'll be able to uh, get the permission. I mean, hopefully, that's, usually it takes around one month or so to, to uh, get the permit from the forestry department. So, yeah. this, so this is um, what, how we suggest you go around uh, doing this. Yeah, thank you so much for the input, Iklas. Definitely, if you do notice flowering trees around your area, do share us the GPS coordinates um, and we, we will um, try and organize around that. Um, alternatively, we are also going to do a workshop using the Seeded app. So that's another way that you can monitor these flowering trees um, and help us out with that as well. Let's say if you are in a location that's harder to reach, um, with the app, we might be able to make that process a lot easier. Okay, so if everyone is done now, um, I'd like to take our group photo. Um, so if everyone can turn on their videos and then we can do a little um, group photo. Iklas, you ready for group pick? Smile, everyone. Okay. Thank you so much.
Okay, well, happy World Environment Day, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today. Um, please feel free to contact me with any further questions or any other inquiries. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.